Well, this morning we're in between book studies. We just finished the Sermon on the Mount. We're gonna start up Titus in July, so just a few weeks for me to freelance. And last week, we took up the church manif- manifesting the manifold wisdom of God by our community and our oneness that we have together. And now this morning, it's Father's Day. Uh, I haven't preached on Father's Day since 2001 or two, something like that, so it's been a while. So welcome to Father's Day. I'm gonna pull out and we are gonna look at what it means, this high calling to be fathers. And so I know these kind of days can be tricky and hard for some of you. Those whose dads have left this earth and there's a lot of emotions that go with this and other dads who did more to hurt you and confuse you and and mess you up and it it just brings a lot of emotion as we look at this and then there's some, uh, as we testify, just realizing how we have failed as dads in many different areas. It can be a crippling thing and so as Greg already mentioned, I I wanna point you to what fathers picture. What, What really, why did God design fathers? We looked yesterday, we had a beautiful wedding ceremony for the stones and I just wanna thank you for all your service. It was beautiful watching everybody in here serving and helping. And so marriage is a beautiful picture to point us to Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And this final resting place is the church at perfect rest with Christ at the marriage supper of the lamb. And marriage gives that picture and it points to it. Well, fathers, you, you point to the ultimate father, the one who will perfectly personify the qualities and traits of a father that we will look at this morning in Ephesians 6, 4, is God the Father. And so I want you to not cling to the type. Don't hold so tightly to the picture, but let it lead you to what it was designed to be. Why did God design fatherhood? It was to lead you to God the Father. God the Father is what this is all about. So honor your fathers this morning by looking only unto Jesus Christ for reconciliation with God and Father, who will satisfy your every need and your every longing that you have. No earthly dad will ever be able to do what your heavenly Father can do in heaven. He will abundantly do more for you than you could ask or hope from any earthly father. And so I just want us to to end today just looking at God the Father and let there be healing if there's any hurt or anything with fatherhood in your own life. And then I just, there's so many young dads here. I, I wanna see you be the kind of dads that we're gonna look at this morning. So your, your elders pray for this. We, we wanna help you in this. And so anyone who's saying, I wanna be this kind of dad, we have so many leaders in this church who could help you in it. Step out, seek it out, and let's all journey together to, to be these kind of dads for the glory of God. So let's go to him in prayer and then we'll open up the word of God. Father, we come before you and we acknowledge that you are holy, 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 and the whole earth is filled with your glory. Father, trying to come into your presence in our own merit would be like throwing a chip in the middle of the noonday sun. Father, for no one can stand in your presence. And so you have sent your son into this world to come and to live the life we should have and die the death that we deserved so that now that veil was torn in two and now we have access to you, O God. We have your spirit who cries, Abba, Father, who now we have the nearness of our God. We are now adopted and we have father, son, and daughter relationship with you. And so God, I thank you for this glorious gospel. These are not small things, these are eternal and they're bigger than anything that we are dealing with here this morning. So I thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in that sweet and precious name that we pray and come into your presence. Amen. Well, if you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I think you guys are on to me. Every time I freelance, I'm ending up in Ephesians. As I kind of look at the lay of the land of America and the the secular tsunami that has engulfed our land, there's really been a, a loss of any moral compass from the destruction of marriage to gender problems to immorality to legalizing of marijuana materialism, alcohol abuse. I could just go on and on and on. We live in the day of jihad with a radical Islam with violence that is ruthless. We have a mental mindset of people who kill others when they're frustrated and our political horizon is dark. I've never seen clearer the need then for fathers. The need for fathers both physical and spiritual. 
to train and prepare our kids to live godly and righteously in this present age that we live in right now in our country. Our kids need to be ready for what they are going to face in this world. We need kids who will stand on the word of God alone. It is the eternal truth that is unchanging and we need to stand on the word. We need to put all of our hope in Christ alone and our eternity with him. We need to swim against the current of this world. And we need to be prepared to suffer persecution and the rejection of this world. Christianity is no longer popular. It is moronic in this day and age. And we need to find fellowship with God to be better than the riches of this world. And so I want to say thank you to our Sunday school teachers and our youth teachers and youth pastor for pouring into these children. And I want to say you to to get the vision of reproducing yourselves in the next generation and pouring into them. This is, a, this is a group project where we all use our gifts together for these children. And I want to thank you mothers who, who labor to teach these to your children. We are, we are blessed with many moms who get to stay home and pour the word of God into these kids. And I want to thank you fathers who are seeking to teach the living God to eternal souls. And so I gladly preach to you this morning, fathers, The biblical father is becoming extinct. We're fleeing our posts and our calling from God. We need men full of Christ and full of the Holy Spirit to take up this most holy and high calling of fatherhood to reproduce their love and their faith in Jesus Christ to the children that God has placed in our homes. And so I spent all week with a bunch of ideas for fatherly day messages and studying, and I always come back to the clearest verse, I think, in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, that teaches about fathers. And so I come again because it's so necessary that we get this. And I'll preach it every year until it takes root in every heart in this congregation. I'm just a patient man. I will keep pounding this and pounding this and pounding this. Don't worry, you'll wear out before I do. I, I know it. So just save me the time and change, okay? Just be dads, fathers that we're going to look at today by the grace of all almighty God. So Ephesians chapter 6. As we come to Ephesians chapter 6, I want to make a few observations that jumped out at me when I preached through this uh, when we were going through Ephesians a little while back. And if you'll look, go to Ephesians 5, verse 21. (coughs) Excuse me. I want you to notice how Paul has presented this section in Ephesians about new relationships in this new covenant of grace. When you're brought into grace, how all these relationships change. And the foundation verse began in verse 21. And he said, be subject then to one another in the fear of Christ. We're to have a spirit of subservience where we lay our lives down to do good to other people. I've died to self. I live now to God and to others. And then Paul now, out of that flow, addresses three sets of relationships. He addresses the relationship of marriage, he addresses the relationships in family, and then he addresses the relationships at work. Whom does he address first in all three relationships? This is an important observation. He addresses the one who is to display the submission. So he addresses first wives, then he addresses first children, And then he addresses first slaves. So he establishes their submission and their subservience by showing their submission to Jesus Christ. So their submission is always unto that person, but unto Jesus Christ ultimately is where they are leading. And so what what does he do? What does he do? So Paul quickly follows it up by turning to the one now then who has the authority in that relationship. And he'll go now to to, uh, husbands and to dads and to bosses. And he will command them that you are to set the climate of the relationship. You have a responsibility to make it easier, natural, compatible. And so you can abuse this authority that God has given to you. And you will stand before God and give an account, you who are the one as the head. You will give an account to God on that last day, and, and you will not be like Christ if you abuse this. Who, who, how did Jesus use his authority? 
He used his authority to lay down his life for his bride and to give it to to pray and intercede daily to perfect and beautify his bride. And so he used his authority to set the atmosphere of love and grace in the church of God, who has made our submission a glad delight unto him. My greatest joy in life is to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made it such a joy. He's beautiful. He's lovely. Look at what he's done. I delight to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. What woman does not want to submit to a man who wants to love her like Jesus Christ loved his bride? What child doesn't want to obey a dad like this? What slave doesn't want to give service to a boss like this business owners? So do not miss this. Fathers. Fathers, see this morning there is an and in Ephesians 6.4. I just, it's a pretty simple observation. There's an and there. The address to children is not over. He's been addressing children in verses 1 through 3. And there are more inspired words to the parent-child relationship. And so children, in verses 1 through 3, you're to obey and to honor your parents. And that is a weighty calling for children. Obey your parents and honor them. For He, he promises long life and blessing for the one who lives under this. So for Father's Day, one of the best things you can do, children, is to obey and honor your parents. Fathers, create an environment for your children then to thrive in this command. We want to provide a climate, dads, for your children's success and the command of their obedience in verses 1 through 3. And I just see too many dads that like to stop at verse 3. I kind of like to stop at verse 3. Dads, we set the tone and the atmosphere of our home. And so the question is, is it harsh? Is, am I setting a tone of harshness? How about pharisaical? Do, do as I say, not as I do. Or one that where mistakes are pounded. There's very little nurturing. You have to earn my love. Standards with no heart. Can't get your, I can't get your attention, Dad, so I will get your negative attention. And fathers. Second observation. I want you to notice the promise of this verse. When your child was conceived, one of the most weighty things that ever fell upon me when I held my first little son in the hospital was that he was an eternal soul. This, this little one that I could hold in my hand was going to live forever. He's eternal. And he's going to live eternally either in heaven or in hell. And as I held that little guy, there was a weight that came over me that still weighs on me to this day. When your child was conceived, your DNA through Adam made him a sinful child separated from God at birth, according to the word of God. Separated. And these truths are so weighty that they can produce a real anxiety. But just listen to this verse then this morning. There's something that you can do to help this eternal, sinful soul. That little smiling cherub that has a sinful soul. There is grace for your children to be forever adopted in the family of God. There is grace for your child. Do you know that God saves children? (laughs) Hallelujah. That's good news. This verse says he uses means and he uses fathers using means. So there are means that God uses, and he uses dads who will use these means that he will lay out here this morning. And so if you can look at an eternal soul that you have passed that deadly poison of sin to, and all you care about is their education, about getting them a house, food, their braces, they have a trampoline, then then we've missed it, dads. We're flops as pops. Men, take up your God-given responsibility to seek to bring them up to God, praying for them, knowing the gospel. Are you laboring to know and experience the gospel of Jesus Christ, to know doctrine, to be people who will dig in this word and grow and learn and understand it, and most importantly, to know Jesus Christ. I need to know him. That was Paul's passion, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Fertilize it with your own holy life, Take up your cross of self-denial. Turn off that TV. Put down your video games. Turn off your cell phones. Goodness. Give yourselves to these kids. I grew up in a, in a home where the gospel wasn't all the way understood, but I'll tell you what. There were seven boys in my family and no sisters. 
And uh, my dad had no friends. When he got off work, he came and he just lived with us. Our backyard was dirt from playing football on it all, all day. You know, and just, uh, I look at all my brothers now. I've got six brothers, and every one of them are family men. You know, and it just, it's amazing what a dad can do to a family. Third observation is just how brief Paul's teaching is on parenting. He just tells us kind of, you think there's going to be all these verses in the Bible on parenting, and in the New Testament there's this verse and there's Colossians that deal directly with parenting. And he just kind of puts it real simple. I mean, marriage got like 11 verses and kids got like three, and and now one of the greatest things I've ever undertaken, probably the hardest thing, is parenting, and he gives me one verse. Thanks, Paul. No wonder you were single. So he, he puts it very simple. He says, there's a pattern to be avoided, dads. Don't exasperate your children. And in Colossians, he says, don't, don't cause them to lose heart. Don't, don't exasperate these children and don't let them lose heart. But here's what you should do. Bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. That's it. That's all that he gives us. He says, don't rule them harshly, but rear them tenderly in fairness and firmness and fondness. And so scripture is sufficient. And so my observation is it's a small verse, but you know what? It's all that you need for parenting. Well, what is it? Well, don't use your authority to provoke your children. Am I creating an adversarial relationship between me and my children? And am I nurturing them? For for some, it's just controlling them. And Paul's going to say, no, you're you're nurturing them to bring them up. I'm bringing them from parental control to self-control. From looking to you, parent, for everything, I'm training them now to look to Jesus Christ for everything. That's my goal as a parent. I want to nurture, and I want to establish them in true godliness. And this is just take it to heart. It's not about you, Dad. It's about Jesus Christ and this calling to point them to him. I I just want to disappear. Remember Paul said, "I, I want him to increase and me to decrease. There's a good picture for parenting. And so let's take a look then at Ephesians 6, 4, this Father's Day. Here's our outline. The holy responsibility of a Christian father, it begins with a clear understanding of the role that God has assigned to you. So look with me in Ephesians 6, 4. And fathers. Do you think Paul forgot the Greek word for parents? I don't think he did because in verse 1 he, he used parents. And so did he forget moms? Doesn't Paul know that I go to work all day and mom does most of the training? I earn the money. I I like to keep the outside of the house. I mow the grass. I can handle this. No, listen to what Paul says. And fathers. Fathers, Paul is saying by the Holy Spirit, you are the chief influence of the home on children. And most dads don't think that way. Mom does it. And Paul says, no, dads, you are the chief one. God made it so. The father's influence is chief. The mother is a huge blessing, and she gives all of her gifts to her husband to be used in the godly training of her children. She is the queen of the house. She is to be obeyed and honored. She is a crucial part in the process. But I want you to hear Paul this morning and fathers. You are to be the most influential influence in the house. You are the leader in this task of raising the next generation of righteousness. You are to set the climate of the home. You are the heads. A lot of you like that title when your wife has to submit to you, but do you like it now when you're the one responsible for the physical, emotional, and spiritual welfare of your home? And fathers, you must set the climate of your home. And Paul has labored hard in this epistle to show us what that climate should be. This verse is not an isolation, but it's the application of a clear flow of thought from the Apostle Paul. We can't pull this verse out now and write books on just this verse. But we need to look, you know, just look at every nuance and roll and say this is what a father is. No, we've got to flow through this whole epistle to understand the doctrine, so to get it, to believe it, so that we can live upon this, that we live lives worthy of the calling that we've received from God. And so you live out Ephesians. If you get Ephesians, 6.4 will be automatic. If you skip it, 6-4 will just become another tablet of stone that will command but will give you no power to keep it. You cannot go back to Moses for your parenting. Let me give you the list of the commands and I'll make myself and my kids keep them. I will work hard to not exasperate them, to nurture them, and to discipline them. And what will happen is your home will smell like Mount Sinai rather than Mount Zion. 
where his commandments are not burdensome, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what kind of man must we be to keep Ephesians 6.4? What must be the climate of our home? Let's take a look at it. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to look with me in verses 3 through 6. The climate of glory. The climate of glory. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Why would you do this, God? To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And so this whole book begins with setting the glory of God on display in his freeness of showing salvation to whomever he pleases. And everything then exists for the glory of God. Everything is to have God at the very center of it. Let it permeate. Everything that you do is for the glory of God. And so this is whether your kids will catch this or just follow a religion. I don't want kids to just follow a religion. I want them to catch this. I want them to get this. They see this in you. My dad had a lot of flaws and a lot of mistakes, but God was his passion in everything that he did. It was not an add-on to his life. It was his life. And you want to show that to your kids that God is central to me and I live for his glory and I'm not just religious and I do nice moral things. I, that'll never get caught. That'll just be taught to your kids. And so I want my kids to see a value in God that he is worth losing your life for. I want them to get that from fathers, from me. Do you want to give your kids that? Show these kids that God is better than them. Show them that. You're not my idol, Timmy, whatever your name is. I hope there's not a kid here named Timmy. I apologize. <laughs> I was not thinking of you. So you're, you're not my idol. God alone holds that place. I love you, and I passionately parent you, but my joy is in Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. My joy is not bound up in you, son or daughter. Oh, what that would do to a city full of parents who think children above all. We preached everywhere and we make them our little idols. What this would do to see a dad who seeks the glory of God even over his own son or daughter. This point was driven home to me so deeply about 15 years ago. I used to, I had these, all these little books I found on martyrs, not on martyrs, on, on missionaries. That's a big difference. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And so I had all these books, and what I loved about them is they would show how they got converted, and then it would show their calling, and then them going to give their lives the rest of their days on earth to serve the living God. And so I was reading to my children one on John Patton. Raise your hand if you've heard of John Patton. Oh, good. So we got a pretty good group here. John Patton was a missionary to the New Hebrides, and the New Hebrides is to the cannibals. And so he went over to, to minister the gospel to the cannibals. And all of his children, it was interesting, after he died, all of his children stayed and kept ministering in that region. And so he, he goes over there, and the reason he went over, when he was a kid, his dad would teach family devotion, family worship every night. And he would be praying for different parts of the country and the world. And John said, I remember looking at his face, and just as he was praying, just saying, God, one day I want to go take my daddy's gospel to that region. And so it was, it was his dad's passion for the gospel and the glory of God to be spread through the nations that began welling up in John Patton's heart. Well, there, there was one night when I was reading him to, to the kids, and I just kind of broke down, overwhelmed. And there was a section about when his father was walking him to the ship that he would get on and go to the New Hebrides. And it would take him to the mission field, and it, most likely his father would never see him again. And so here they are walking, and... And he's going to have to say goodbye to this son forever here on earth. And I want you to listen to what he said. He said, my dear father walked with me the first six miles of the way. His counsels and tears and heavenly conversation on that parting journey are fresh in my heart as if it had been but yesterday. And tears are on my cheeks as freely now as then. Whenever memory steals me away to that scene. 
For the last half mile or so, we walked on together in almost unbroken silence. My father, as was often his custom, carrying his hat in hand while his long flowing yellow hair streamed like a girl's down his shoulders. His lips kept moving in silent prayers for me, and his tears fell fast when our eyes met each other in looks for which all speech was just vain. He halted on reaching the appointed parting place, and he grasped my hand firmly for a minute in silence, and then solemnly and affectionately said, God bless you, my son. Your father's God prosper you and keep you from all evil. Unable to say more, his lips kept moving in silent prayer. In tears, we embraced and we parted. I ran off as fast as I could and went about to turn a corner in the road where he would lose sight of me. I looked back and I saw him still standing with his head uncovered where I'd left him gazing after me. Waving my hat in adieu, I rounded the corner and out of sight an instant. But my heart was too full and sore to carry me further. So I darted into the side of the road and wept for a time. Then rising up cautiously, I climbed the dike to see if yet stood where I had left him. And just at that moment, I caught a glimpse of him climbing the dike and looking out for me. He did not see me, and after he gazed eagerly in my direction for a while, he got down. He set his face toward home and began in return, his head still uncovered, and his heart, I felt sure, still rising in prayers for me. I watched through blinding tears till his form faded from, from my gaze. And then hastening on my way, I vowed deeply and off by the help of God to live and act so as never to grieve or dishonor such a father and mother as he had given to me. God is so beautiful. There's not a program for what was going on. There's no system for what I just read. Just a man who was God-saturated in all that he did. And as I read that with these three wide-eyed little boys... I just pray, God, will you make me to be a dad like that? Climate of glory. The second thing, dads, is we need to set a climate of grace. A climate of grace, which has been all of chapter 2 and chapter 1. It's been the theme going through Ephesians. And so you can't parent this way unless you carry out this command from your own personal expression of the lavish grace of God. You can't do 6-4 unless you've tasted of God's grace, that you have personally drank from the cup of grace. Do you know this grace of God personally? I'm not asking if you know the doctrines of grace. I'm saying, do you know this grace personally and experientially in your own life? This is the key to the whole thing, fathers. A guy that just knows a lot of doctrine and doesn't know grace will produce some of the harshest, meanest children I've ever seen since I've been in ministry. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 is not just a treatise on the depravity of man, but it's this. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I was unwilling and I was unable. I turned to my own way. I was dead to God. I was alive to sin and my own pleasure at any cost. I was a rebel. By the grace of God, I've been born again, and I know the grace of God, and I'm dead to sin, but alive to God now by grace, you have been saved. And so now I can nurture my children in the kindness that God has shown to me. It's experiential. I I, I can't get over this. It's the source and fountain of the kindness that is poured on my children. It pours into me by my communion with God, and it pours out upon my children the graciousness of our God. I was so far off and I've been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. My little ones need this grace. Let them see the influences of grace in my life upon their life, O God. I now have such a ready access to my Father. Let my children have such a ready access to their earthly Father. Are we fathers who have been humbled by grace? Are all of our dealings now with our own out of the spirit of grace? What is this, what this will do to a home And what it will do to the children in it is beautiful. It's an atmosphere for children to thrive in obeying their parents in the Lord. Have you set a climate of grace in your home, dads? Or is it a climate of thrashing and yelling and harshness and exacting? That is usually what comes out of a man who's not resting in Christ alone for his salvation. And so... Fathers, set a climate of glory and set a climate of grace 
And thirdly, set, this is almost the whole outworking in Paul's epistle, is set a climate of maturing in a local church. Set a context of maturing in a local church. This fleeing the church in our day and age is destructive, wrong, heresy, opposite of Scripture. Ephesians 2, Jew and Gentile are now reconciled. I preached it last week. Now we have oneness and we have unity from all different walks of life. It's beautiful. Gifts are given now to the building up of one another into the head. And so in Ephesians 4.16, he says the body's causing the growth of the body. All of our gifts working together are growing us up into the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been put into a local body with all these gifts. I need every one of them. My kids need every one of them. They're here. God puts them in and together, working together, just like all the parts of my body cause a kid to grow up. And so we're going to grow up into the head, the Lord Jesus Christ, with these gifts. And so do our children see us, keep ourselves from people who don't believe everything the way that we do that look like us or smell like us? Do we model that to them? Do we see the priority of the body of Christ? Do you see the need to use your gifts and have others use their gifts in your lives? I just, it burdens me again and again when I have all the gifts I'm gonna pull out of the church and all my kids need is my gifts. That is, that's just What's the Hebrew word? Baloney. That's baloney. Do they see you be vulnerable then in the body of Christ? Do they see you strive to keep the unity of the body of Christ? Do they hear you talk bad about all the members, gossip about them, slander, put them down, mock their beliefs and practices? No one's as mature as you. Do they see that? I think the best thing that I ever gave to my kids next to a love for Jesus Christ was a love for his bride. The local expression of it. They watched mom and dad give their lives for this body. They watched our friends love us and be there for us in this journey. They were the recipients of so much agape love from this church. You guys loved my family so beautifully. I thank you for that. They love Southside. They have watched their parents grow in faith because of this body causing the growth of the body. Your kids need to see your commitment to the body of Christ, sacrificing for one another, loving and praying for each other, weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those who rejoice, bearing, forbearing, forgiving, always striving to keep the unity of the faith. They need to see this. Fathers. They don't need a dad running from church to church looking for the perfect one. It's done more damage to children. Don't do that. There is only a perfect Savior working with imperfect people. The gift of teaching your kids is to work through conflict in the church family. And what this does for children, I've never read a book about what happens to families who make the body of Christ central, yet Paul said it is. And I don't want you to miss that. Get in the body of Christ and watch what it will do for your children. Have you given yourself to the body of Christ? Fathers, you're the lead in this. Have you given it? If you don't give yourself to it and exhort your kids to do it, you're a Pharisee. Have you given yourself to it? Turn to Ephesians chapter five. The fourth climate that we need to set dads in our home, and I'm going to pick, pick up the pace. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. I pray that we will set the aroma of love, that we will never get over the love that God has had for us in Christ Jesus. I can't get over it. And I want to set the aroma of love in this home. I want them to see and manifest and say there's got to be the Holy Spirit in that man, the way he loves. Uh, Verse 3, chapter 5, verse 3 through 7. This is probably one of the greatest things that our country needs from dads. In verse 3, do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. 
For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. We live in a day of impurity like I've never seen before. And dads, what your kids need is a pure dad, a man fighting his lusts and his desires. Uh, Pastor Al Martin one time said, my dad never looked twice at a woman. He never took a wrong gaze at a woman all of my days living in that home with him. Dads, I pray in a day that is so impure and broken, that we'll give to our kids a man who fights to have a pure mind and a pure heart in this land that has just gone haywire in sexuality. Six, in Ephesians 5.18, but do not... Get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Do we, do we know what it means to be filled with the Spirit? Go back to when I preached on it. I can't do it now. But when we're filled with the Spirit, we are being led by the Spirit of God, and he's manifesting Christ to us as we commune and find our all in all in him. And he's saying that, that all these relationships cannot be kept unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. So you'll never be able to love your wife like Christ loved the church unless the Spirit of God is filling you. And you'll, ne- you'll never be able to be a dad unless the Spirit of God is filling you to do this. And you'll never be able to treat your employees right unless the Spirit of God is filling you. So I pray that we will be men seeking to be filled with the Spirit. We're commanded to do that. So we're indwelt and sealed with the Spirit when we're saved. But as believers, we're commanded to be being filled with the Spirit. And then lastly, we need to be a man ready for the warfare, warfare that will come after us. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, Paul says to put on the full armor of God that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. And so we need to be a man that if you're going to live this way, all hell is going to come against you. And you're going to need to learn how to do spiritual battle. You're going to need to know how to stand with the shield and the breastplate and all that God has given to us. We need to be those who will fight against the enemy and the darkness of our land. There'll be a battle. If you start doing this, do you think it's just going to be easy and everyone's going to clap and say, I love what you're doing, Jim. Good job. You're, you've really improved yourself. Is it, they're going to hate you. They're going to hate you. And you're, all hell is going to come against you if you want to be these kind of men imparting the gospel of Jesus Christ into your children. And fathers. That is to be the climate of our home. Glory, grace, the local church, love, purity, fullness of the spirit, and stand against the attacks of the devil. And so men, what, what young men, what I want to offer to you today is you need help in this. Probably the last thing is that you, you need help. So don't just sit alone and, and struggle and drown and die. That's why God has given you men who have gone before you. And so I want you to seek out older men. And to go to them and just say, will you help me? Will you teach me? I don't even know how to do family worship. Uh, Will you teach me how to do that? We have some amazing men who know how to do that. And so don't just sit there and and drown with with all that God has given you. Why why die in the desert of thirst when you got a bottle of water? you got all these older men who will help you and teach you. And so let's let's dig in and, and do this together. Find a mentor. Spend at least twice a month or or weekly would be best to to help train and teach. And so I just can't exhort you enough, uh, young men in this and and young women in this with the older women as well. Amen? Amen. Easy enough? (laughs) Possible unless we are filled with the Spirit of God. So I want to close with every time I preach on parenting, I close with the same quote, but I just, I need to hear it again and again, and I'm going to let you hear it again and again. So it's one of my favorite preachers of all time. His name was Martin Lloyd-Jones. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. What we have to do is to make Christianity attractive. We should give our children the impression that the most wonderful thing in the world is Christianity and that there is nothing else in life that is comparable to being a Christian. We should create in them the desire to be like us. They see us and they see the joy and that we have in it and that that. Uh, the way we wonder and marvel at it all. And they should be saying to themselves, I am longing to be as old as them so that I can enjoy it as much as they obviously do. Our method must never be mechanical, legal, or repressive. Our testimony must never be forced. But in all we are, do, and say, 
Let them know that we ourselves are bond slaves of Jesus Christ and that God in his grace has opened our eyes and awakened us to the most glorious things in the world and that our greatest desire for them is that they may enter into the same knowledge and have the same joy and have the highest privilege possible in this world that is serving the Lord and living to the praise of his glory and his grace. Amen. I just want to close then, if you're here um, and you're a father who has never experienced the grace that I've just preached about, is that you, you can't do what I just said. And so the greatest thing that your kids need is for you to come to a Savior who came into this world and went up on a cross and died to take the justice of God for what your sin deserved so that he could give you mercy. And so what you need more than anything is just in the silence of your heart this morning is to look away from self. I'm going to go get, I'm going to be a better dad. I'm going to work harder. He wants you to look away from that. That'll never help. And he wants you to look to the one who has now risen from the dead and see at the right hand of God who's able to save to the uttermost all who will come near to God through him. Will you look and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be reconciled to God so that now you can learn what a father's like so you can pour that into your children. And so I, I pray that if you'd like to talk about that, uh, anything at all, I'll be up here afterwards with a couple other elders and we would love to help you in that. And I just pray for our dads who are believers that just want to encourage you. What we just looked at is so beautiful. It's supernatural. You can't do it in your own strength. And I want you to, to continue to keep coming to a Christ who can bear this kind of fruit in your life. And for those, again, who feel like I've blown it, I did this so poorly, um, I, I want you, again, to just see that there's only one Father who's perfect, and that's where we're trying to point all of these kids to. And then remember, there is no mechanistic way that, that, that guarantees the salvation of children. And so I, I, I just don't, I, I hate that when you say, if you do these six things, you're guaranteed to get a saved kid. That just is not true. Kids are saved by the grace of God and the grace of God alone. And so we will continue to hold up the only thing that can save them. And I just will hold up Jesus Christ till I quit breathing. And so I pray for any who have wayward children today that you'll see the glorious hope is there's a Savior. And I don't care how old they are, there's a Savior for old kids and young kids. There's a Savior for grandfathers and for babies. There's a Savior. And that's why we gather to worship this risen Savior. So let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you that there's a Savior. I thank you that you give children. God, what a gift they are from the Lord. And I just pray, Lord, for, for every one of the kids here, Lord, that every one of them would know Jesus Christ. I pray that, that if they don't, that they would give their dad the greatest gift they could ever give and bow their knee this morning to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to give up the old, their own reins and just take hold of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe upon him. God, give that gift today. And I pray for dads, Lord, that you will give us the grace to be these kind of men. Lord, that you would give the elders of this church to be these kind of men in their shepherding. Lord, that you would, would cause us all to be these kind of men and even women. Lord, that the women, that the wives would take all these principles, they're all for them as moms as well. Lord, and that we would manifest Christ to these children. And by your sovereign grace, that you would open eyes for children to see and love and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.